Hello, everyone, and welcome to Turnstile Tours Virtual Programming. My name is Doug Chapman, and I'll be your host today. I'm a guide with Turnstile Tours, and it's my absolute pleasure to uh, be your host today as we visit a very special place in Brooklyn, the Endale Arch uh, at Prospect Park. Uh, which has received recently uh, an absolutely magnificent restoration and will be joined very quickly by Serena Rabinowitz and Curtis Barnhart who were um, directly involved in the restoration of the arch. Um, and we also have my colleague Andrew Gustafson from Trimstyle Tours live and on site. So we'll be having a live and in-person visit to the arch as well. So I think um, this would be a, a great time to welcome our guests on to the program today, Curtis Barnhart and Serena Rabinowitz. Um, welcome to the program. So glad to have you here. And um, Curtis is able to join us too. Um, Serena, why don't you get us started with, uh, hey Curtis, welcome. Um, Serena, why don't we start with you? Um, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and uh, what your role is with the Prospect Park Alliance and, uh, and, and a little bit of your involvement in the, in the arch restoration. Sure, so I'm an assistant architect at the Prospect Park Alliance. And within the Alliance, we have a team, a design and construction division that um, is a team of architects, uh, landscape architects, um, a historian and archivist and resident engineers. So we all together uh, work to uh, maintain elements of the park and create new elements of the park. So, uh, you know, this project was, was an effort, not only uh, in terms of architecture, but also landscape ar architecture and included restoration of the surrounding landscape as well. And how long you've been working with the Alliance, Serena? I've been with the Alliance about two and a half years now. Okay, yeah. And it's, it, and how many architects and landscape architects are, are employed by the, by the Alliance at the moment? So design and construction well, is about 10 people. So there, there are three architects, um, four landscape architects. Well. It's just a significant workforce. Well, so it's great to have you here. Welcome. And, and Curtis, um, how, about, how about yourself? Tell us a little bit about your, your background and your, your participation in the, in the um, arch restoration. Sure. I've, I've been doing historical restoration in the New York City, Long Island area since the mid 80s. And uh, uh, I own Barnhart Restoration and we uh, do a variety of historical restoration um, from complete renovations to uh, smaller projects that so we restore windows and doors or replace in kind, uh, copying the old ones if, if necessary. So uh, a lot of really interesting stuff. Fantastic. And um, is this the first project that you've worked on in Prospect Park or has there been other, were there other works, other projects before this? Yeah, we've, we've, we did, uh, a couple of bridges by the ponds, the upper ponds where the water source comes in. And uh, we did a rustic shelter on, uh, by the uh, ice skating rink on the Prospect Lake, which was neat. It's about 35 feet tall, pretty, pretty large structure and uh, done several other smaller projects throughout the park. Okay, one, one of the fun things that was not historical except for in the context of the storm Sandy, they mm -hmm. lost about a thousand large trees right. in Prospect Park. And uh, uh, we were able to make a, a children's playground, if you will, or exploration area out of those trees, which was a fun oh, thing. The, the Zucker uh, children's playground, you were involved yeah. in that. Yeah. Really wonderful little, little look. I'm sure many of our viewers have been there. Um, thanks for that, that brief introduction, Curtis. We're going to hear a lot from you, and I can't wait to hear more of your more stories from you about your experience with with the arch and other projects. Serena, could you give us a little bit of a, an orientation about where we are, um, and just to give our viewers a sense of the geography of the park? Endale Arch is located near Grand Army Plaza, so that's the it's the north um, side of the Long Meadow. And so as you walk from Grand Army Plaza you would take a pedestrian you know, uh, paved path down through Endale Arch and that would 
lead you to uh, the long meadow. And again, we'll see some photos and maybe even live the uh, very prized view of the long meadow, the framed view. That, Can we do that? Can we just do that? Let's let's see if Andrew's uh, alive and well on site and in, in in the park. It's a it's a very cold day, so we're very grateful to Andrew for for being with us. Hi, Andrew. Welcome. Hey, Doug. Well, well and covered. Hi, day Serena there. and Curtis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm uh, so I'm just north of the Endale Arch. Um, so what's it What's right it now. like there? How's the, any a lot of people around or no? Little... No, the park is very quiet today. <laughs> I think everybody's just trying to stay warm. So right. I'm I'm okay, but I'm also here with. Uh, with Salty, so she's oh, joined me again. <laughs> Some of you may have seen Salty last week on our program with um, uh, about the uh, puppet uh, puppet library. Right. Um, but yeah, so yeah, let's uh, let's let's take a yeah, little let's walk. Take us on a walk, a Andrew. Yeah. Um, so and Serena and Curtis, uh, you know, feel free to 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 chime in as we go through. But this is, of course, the the one of the main pedestrian ac access ways to the park coming from Grand Army Plaza just up that direction uh, down into the into the Long Meadow. So Endale Arch was it was completed in 1868 and it was the very first permanent structure that was built in Prospect Park by Olmsted and Vox. And so this this design or this concept was really a pedestrian passageway that separated you could see above um, as Andrew is going you can see that the, there's a road above so this pedestrian passageway separated the horse and carriage traffic from pedestrian traffic right so yeah that's that's leads to the road above as you can see for a see so and beautiful. it also acted as a rain and snow shelter. Um, original, that was part of the original intent. But as you can see, Andrew walking through, you get this very, uh, you get that that prized view, this framed view uh, that is has become so well known out to the Long Meadow. And that is recognized as a as a, a classic view and within landscape architecture as a field, right? I mean, this is. This is the holy grail of, of uh, achievements in some ways. Yeah, I think it, uh, the arch also exemplifies the philosophy um, of Olmsted and Box of blending the architecture with landscape and, um, you know, in, in terms of the form as well as the materials and then the, you know, purposeful framed views. Right. Beautiful. Yeah, such wonderful. <clears throat> You know, I, I have to say, my it really took my breath away when I when I saw the restoration for the for the first time. I, I and you know what's remarkable is even in, even in its condition before the restoration, it was still a beautiful thing. You know, and so the um, so Andrew's now doing some fancy backwards walking. <laughs> so yeah, the most striking thing I think is is uh, you know you could see the the pattern of the of the new wood that has been installed. Um, and that's right. Eastern white pine and black walnut. Um, and so Curtis, I don't know if you wanna talk about how we, you know, some of the discoveries throughout the process and, and the process of how we, we figured out what was there and, and um, kind of the surprise that we all had. Well, yeah. Um, and Curtis, let's just, here we go, Andrew's, Andrew's about to walk out into the, and give us a little bit of a perspective on the Longmeadow side. And, um, you know, Serena, you mentioned a few things about uh, why this is such a significant space. Curtis, I'd love to hear your articulation, your thoughts around what makes the Endale Arch such a, such a special environment, a special achievement. Well, it, it, the arch in and of itself, if it were just a blank tunnel, would be an amazing portal from even back in 1867 when the street noises were different than they are today, but they were quite loud. Uh, horse, horseshoes on the cobblestones, uh, carriages with steel wheels and vendors and, and uh, voices and the hustle and bustle on Flatbush was, was uh, 
sort of kind of like it is today, you know, on a busy, right. busy day. And this little path that led to this little arch tunnel was like a time machine. It took you from busy city life to a gorgeous, gorgeous landscape out in the country. And, and interestingly yeah. too, the acoustics of what you can hear on the north side of the arch next to where the traffic is compared to what you can hear on the other side of the arch is completely different. It's like you've entered in another time and space. So the fact that right. they chose to do this first showed how important of a structure it was in what they were wanting to accomplish by appreciating the entry to the park. So that being said, when we walked into the park uh, this morning and looked at the first little passageway, this little uh, alcove, if you will, there were originally benches there, but you might have saw some stone and brick. So when I first came to the arch, there was just a little bit of wood left on a little bit of wood left on the south end, but it was all this brick that you see here. The whole arch is made out of this amazing uh, craftsman-like brickwork. And even though it was always meant to be covered up, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, the designers of Prospect Park Alliance decided that it would be really nice to leave some of what was underneath the wood in these two openings so that you could see you know, the work from past, what they use, the materials they used, and what, what an amazing job they did underneath mm -hmm. the wood. Yeah, so there, so there's, go ahead. So, so yeah, early on, that was a definitely a discussion that we had when we, you know, we know that historically speaking, the entire arch was covered with this wood paneling, but there's that layer of history and expert craftsmanship that we didn't want to cover up that we want to be to people to continue to be able to see and appreciate um, and understand architecturally and historically what the arch is. So that was something early on we said, you know, how do we, it's already missing, the wood is already missing, we already have it exposed, how can we um, design this so that we, we have this kind of uh, little bit of history that that remains exposed. Um, so that was that was something we decided early on and then and then uh, actually building it was was a challenge in, of a, in and of itself as Curtis I'm sure will will describe um, because you know, these are not simple the arches and, and curves are a lot more complex than they appear. Right. Um, yeah, so there are some, we, uh, we do have uh, a couple of historic photographs of the archway. Maybe, maybe what we can do is just jump to those for a second and then uh, come back to the arch uh, with Andrew, if you can bear with us. Uh, but that's a beautiful frame, framing of one of the archways. So, so, the, so the exposed arch that we just saw with the, I believe, granite stone originally would have looked uh, like this. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. They all would have been identical? Right. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, so here are some historic shots uh, dated for you. So what are we looking at here, uh, Serena? So these are a series of images that um, we have in the Prospect Park archives. Um, and you know, you can see in some of them, you can see the wood paneling, that one number four on the right um, from 1935. So this is, this is a pretty interesting image to me because you do see the wood paneling, you see the wood ribs, but you see a monochromatic appearance. You don't get that uh, alternating wood, uh, the different colors. But what you also see is on the bottom left corner, you see a little bit of a bench. And we do know that originally there were benches, but this photo was taken in 1935. So by then already the original wood benches were missing and they were replaced here with a 
Central Park CK style bench. So that has been a kind of an ongoing question and a really interesting mystery for us to try to solve um, what exactly were, what did these benches look like? Um, you know, yeah, that would question be- about the benches. Right. So that's, that's an ongoing point of research. And you were saying, Serena, that you had, you walked through every archway in Central Park looking for evidence that might help you figure out what the Endell arch benches might have been. Sure, and we do have in the Meadowport Arch um, in Prospect Park. Even there, there are benches, but um, you know, just to have complete research and and real, you know, a real picture of exactly what these were would be great. And before embarking right. in a restoration, yeah, yeah restoration project. I love that part, yeah, yeah, um, it's great to have that historic historic context. Um, a couple of questions here uh, from an individual. Uh, uh, is there any evidence of Jacob Ray Mould's participation in the decorative design? I'm not familiar with that in that name, Jacob Ray. Is that Jacob Ray Mould? Is that familiar to you, Serena, or or Curtis? Not to me. Okay. Well, maybe if uh, Beth, if you have more information about that, please please pass that along. Uh, it's a very interesting interesting point. Um, and um, uh, Beth also asked, is there any remnants of the original wood? And I think there is. Um, so maybe that's a good prompt to go back to the arch. So it's interesting, that zebra pattern of the wood and that historic photograph that we just saw, you saw that zebra pattern of the stone on the outside as well. Very subtle, but also very, um, you know, distinct. Um, yeah. So right there where Andrew is showing um, us now, that, that first cross vault there um, on both sides actually is original wood. Mm. Um, that, that's the original. So, Curtis, um, you know, throughout this process, can you talk about a little, a little bit about, um, you know, how you created? Sure. Well, we, we really, um, I, uh, Chris, Christian Zimmerman, uh, vice president with uh, Capital Projects and the Alliance, showed me the arch several years ago when. Uh, he was thinking of having it restored and all of the wood that was left, which was these two vaults, they weren't completely intact, but there is quite a bit of wood left. And the last bit of the south end of the arch, they still was wood intact, but it was all painted green, uh, uh, park green. And you can see a little bit of it there. And uh, so if you look there and if you notice, there's also wood, two strips running vertically uh, up the brick on top of the water table. So that's important to talk about the two in a few minutes. But basically, we were, Christian and I were saying, we wonder what kind of wood was this? Was this, you know, just uh, some common native lumber? Or was it uh, perhaps mahogany or something else? And so uh, once we, started stripping and we just a little bit we realized the alternating uh, patterns in the wood and uh, it was eastern white pine and American black walnut and uh, it was old virgin material it was really really in good shape uh, what was left and uh, so uh, we were able to salvage enough of what was left on the sea the main part of the arch to uh, restore these two um, original arches and keep it all with the original wood, which was really, really neat. Even, even the molding is original for most part. So uh, that was quite an amazing find. And it made so much more sense too when we cleaned off some of the stone and saw the brilliant yellow and uh, brown stone. So uh, it, it was stunning. And then looking at the original rendering where you can see both things, you, you, it's almost modern type architecture, you know, a little along the lines of Art Deco. It's just like something that you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily think of in the Victorian area. Mm -hmm. And, and um, again, what this, were the pieces oh, of wood? White pine and? Black walnut, American black walnut. Black walnut right there, yeah. Um, this is so, Andrew, I, I, I had a question actually. Yeah. Which is, as we zoom in here, it looks like there are some uh, pieces that aren't 
there anymore. Um, were you able to find out were these uh, were these wood carvings that were here? It looks like they were maybe nailed on. Yeah, well, it, it, you you might think that um, if you look real close at the holes, the holes there are uh, the end of an auger drill bit that they did by hand to mortise something into ah. the wood. So we are thinking it was probably some sort of metal decorative cast pass possibly uh, for the benches, the original benches. That's a clear photo. So, right. so yeah, that's part of the uh, mis current, the, the continuing mystery of the benches and um, trying to figure out what they what they really what look they like, look like. Yeah. Um, yeah. but as like curtis said he has some insights into how how it was perhaps put together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so and we uh, cindy showed us the photograph before of the of the archway with with very little wood what do we know about where the wood got to why is why was it so laid bare um do we know the? Do we know any any sort of history around why the why the wood might have been removed in the first place? Um, well, it, it was a uh, a shelter of sorts sometimes from the cold, from the wind. At some point, and I, I Serena may know, but at some point there was a fire on the north end uh, okay. that destroyed a lot of the uh, original material. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and so you, you hinted at something earlier, Curtis, that uh, something about the water and, and, the, and the role of the wood and, and separating sort of, uh, you know, providing that shelter. What were you, what were you about to talk about um, in terms of the waterproofing of the space, I think? Yeah, um, I mean, we, th there was originally waterproofing, and I think there is still some left. In the future, we may be able to do a little bit more waterproofing, but we did provide air gaps and, and weep holes so that the water, if it does come in at any point, it will find its way out and the wood should last a good long time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have photos of uh, before and after of some of the restoration. I think now might be a good time to just take a look at that. Such a striking contrast and really, really fun. And um, that picture she just pulled up is an interesting picture. Um, as you look down the corridor there, you can see those strips of wood that are every four feet attached to the bricks. And you can see they follow the, the arch and that's an elliptical arch. So the radius is continually changing and gets flatter as it go, go, gains an elevation. But those strips of wood were actually three pieces of clear cedar that they laminated together with nails and every two feet, they laid a piece of wood into the brick so they could take the cut square nails and nail this uh, backing in because you can't just put this tongue and groove material right on the brick. You need some sort of backing. And as beautiful and as uniform as the brick surface is, it undulates up and down an inch, inch and a half and uh, isn't a perfect surface. So if you want the wood to turn out like a wood floor or a ship's hull, it has to be laid on a nearly perfect planed surface. And in this case, it's a elliptical arch. So each one of those pieces of wood had to end up in the same place. So um, of course now we, uh, we didn't have the luxury of having sound wood in the masonry and we wanted this to last as long as possible. So we, uh, we used a, uh, a wood fiber and plastic material, recycled plastic as our backing. But we, we didn't have the luxury of, of knowing exactly how they did it. So what we did was we created a half of an ellipse, a big, a big form, I think, Cindy may have a picture of it in construction. But yes. basically, you we process photos. Yeah, so we made uh, the ellipse perfectly so it would work in every scenario. And I believe that first, yeah, you can see some of our um, backing there. And there's little black shims if you look close on the left side. 
And what we did is we would take the shim, uh, the, the template, and it's attached to the scaffold when we're using it. And then we take a laser, put the laser at the bottom of the template so we get it at exactly the right elevation. And then we had a, a line on the water table, that piece of stone, so it was exactly the right uh, line. And then we would take our scaffold, which had screw jacks, and raise it up or down until it was perfect on the laser. And then we would take the backing and bump shims into it until it touched our template so that each one uh, was exactly the same. When we were done, we put a jet line across the, the whole thing, and it was like within an eighth of an inch everywhere. So it made it for a very interesting, nice install. But it, without getting that first detail, which was kind of more tedious than, than anything else, right, it, it just would not have looked. It looked like a, uh, waves on the sea just going up and down and lippage and everything so it was it was fun and challenging to, to figure that's a that out. tremendous amount of technology um, and in your experience as a, as a in, in the craft of working with this with this wood um, and thinking back to 1860s uh, how is it is it is it is it as impressive to you as it is to me oh, that yeah. were, well I mean and, to... and if there's any carpenter jointers out there, none of the intersections of the wood are cut with a miter saw. The, the elliptical pieces of trim are uh, four foot pieces and they intersect with the horizontal trim. And when they intersect, the horizontal trim is coped. So the back side of the wood is, is hand cut out to match the profile of the wood that it's intersecting. And it, it reads as if it was a 45 degree angle, but it's not a lot more labor. And it's, it's a much nicer job. And if there's any wood movement or shrinkage or anything, uh, the joint doesn't open up because it's solid wood. So it's, uh, but to do that, they did that with chisels and coping saws, all hand tools. It was amazing. And it's I'm sure awesome. that they did the, they had to do almost the same thing to put their backing in. Uh, and yeah. I cheated a little bit because my background is um, uh, ornamental plaster. So we made a lot of domes and, and flying buttresses and stuff. And we'd always use a jig similar to that because okay. that's what they did at this time and hundreds of years earlier. Well, we should do a program with you about the Guastavino arches. I'd love to hear your thoughts around, around that, that technique. But we have a question about uh, from Sandra about the lighting, and maybe this is a good time to, to, to talk about that, that the LED lighting down the middle there, obviously that's a contemporary addition. Tell us about the uh, thought process behind incorporating that. Maybe Serena, you could comment on that discussion. I'm sure there was quite a bit of discussion. Yeah, so when we found the arch and started the project, there were these DOT light, like giant lights, we removed those. Um, originally, of course, there was no lighting, historically speaking. Um, but, in, you know, I think the lighting was something we, we were really keen on, on adding um, for the aesthetic, for highlighting the wood, um, but also, you know, for safety um, as well. So, we wanted to get the, uh, we wanted to be able to provide lighting that wouldn't, that wouldn't really be seen, but that would highlight the curve of the arch and the wood uh, pattern of the arch. So, you know, one other interesting thing that, that kind of came later in our, in the, in the construction process was we realized that there was that top piece of trim, while there was a top piece of trim, it was slightly different than um, the other ribs that went the whole length of the arch. So it actually was two pieces that were put together and it was missing a little bit of, of the original profile. So Curtis and his team kind of came up with some templates, some, some tests, so, you know, some, some variations and we tested them all just to see what would work the best um, and came up with this 
kind of concave design um, that provided not only uh, a space to, pr to put the lighting strip, but it also was designed to provide a vent, as Curtis talked about before, that allowed airflow um, and would prevent any water damage. So that top piece of trim is actually really important and uh, was designed for the way it's designed for a lot of reasons. So the airflow would be between the brick and the and the wood, is that correct? To allow some, some movement up in that space. That's right, and it, bends, it can vent at the top. Right. In that space. Right, and then so the, that top piece of trim was also designed to have a space for the LED strip to, to run the entire length of the arch. It's really quite remarkable and shows, uh, and really to me that highlights one of the Alliance's uh, strong, you know, one of the things I admire most about your architectural choices uh, in and around the park is really paying attention to the original um, and very subtle uh, and nuanced ambitions of the of the original design, um, um, and also bringing in some contemporary elements, which uh, which can build on that and take advantage of you know contemporary uh, technology and awareness, uh, but still be keeping in keeping in line with the um, with the with the original design concepts. Um, this is a stunning example of that. Um, and uh, yeah. the, please, Curtis. We know that. Originally, it did not have lights, but at some point, lights were put in. Um, they, when we got there, they probably we probably saw a picture of them. They're not noticeable, but they were these huge, eight-foot-long, fluorescent-looking lights, and and they were mounted right on top of the wood, and everything was giant pieces of conduit and so forth. So, although mm -hmm. they were put in for security reasons, and I think it's really nice that we have them today to get them a little more subtle than what they were was our goal and i think we achieved it uh, absolutely the, yeah. uh, the 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 one thing is that we're working on right now is uh, the park only has electricity at night but on a gray cloudy day like today uh, the the arch is pretty dark and uh, it will help for a variety of things with security if we lit it during the day. So we're hoping to, by spring, have uh, the, the arch lit in the day as well. Yeah, uh, that's a, what a, you know, be useful. Um, a question, question from a uh, longtime viewer, Ken, how, how long is the end, how long is the tunnel essentially from end to end? It's, uh, oh, what's the dimensions there? Yeah, it's, it's, 75 foot one inch and the only reason I know that is because I had to order the LEDs exactly that long. <laughs> That's not the only reason you spent a lot of time staring at that ceiling Curtis. A, well over each brick. <laughs> each inch of that means something special to you. Um, let's um, let's go back and take a look at uh, some of the other before and after shots and um, and uh, just to see, because I think there's some really nice images there that our viewers might like to might like to see. And then we can uh, move on to a couple other questions. Um, I'd love to hear um, Curtis about your 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 awareness and appreciation for Vox as a designer. But these are some of the historic photos that we've that we've looked at. Uh, again, you can see the zebra pattern there. Yeah, I mean, we haven't talked really much about the uh, the stone. Um, so. You know, if you look back at that um, that lithograph um, from the annual report, you know this was one of the few images that really had that both the striking pattern within the arch for the wood, but also on the on the exterior and stone. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think when we first started the project cleaning the stone and kind of uh, looking at the, the colors of it as, as it began to, to reveal itself once all these layers were removed and it started, it was, you know, and Curtis was working on cleaning it. I mean, it was another really striking surprise, um, you know, how vibrant those colors were. So I think we have some photos of, yeah, here's a before and after. So that's before, and then this is after, you know. So at, uh, Curtis, do you wanna to touch on some of the, that cleaning? I think that's also- Yeah, it's, uh, 
it's Ohio yellow limestone and uh, very, very bright. Um, we did notice early on it attracted uh, biological growth that quickly turned black. So uh, it, in the rendering, it's all nice and bright. And, but one of the earliest photos we have, the, the limestone is already turning black. And then the, if you look at the picture straight ahead, you'll see brown stone, you'll see a, a limestone, then what looks like a blue stone, and then a brown stone. So uh, the brown stone is actually blue stone that they put a very, very, very thin coating on. And I'm trying to stump all my stone conservatives and sending them photos and dragging them to the arch to ask what technique was this? Because I have not found any documentation, anything anywhere that had this same te technique to turn the uh, blue stone brown. Um, one, one scientist thinks it might be oxidation, but it's, it's interesting because places where that coating fell off, it, it, the blue stone didn't oxidate. So, so very interesting. They went, they went to a lot of work to uh, do that. But what had happened is not only had the biological growth happened, originally there was little combed lines in all the stone. They were uh, some sort of tool carves little lines in every stone to make them uh, look more hewn. And uh, they were gone in a lot of areas and the, the stone is actually um, starting to come off in layers like you see on brownstone sometimes. So we, we actually took a little bit of stone off mechanically and polished it. And that's when we found the bright yellow color. So we put some biological growth inhibitor on the stones and we're gonna see you know how long it lasts. Right. So what we're looking at there, how, what, how much work is that or is represented by cleaning that one face of the arch, uh, Curtis? Um, that can't have been an easy job. No, no, we, we, we actually used, um, we have a dustless blaster and we tried that. We did some of the paint removal with that as well, which is water vapor and you can use any medium. We use some uh, black walnut shells. We tried uh, uh, a couple other things, uh, recycled glass seemed to work the best and do the least amount of damage. Mm -hmm. But so that didn't really do what we needed it to do because it really needed resurface. So we, we used diamond cup grinders uh, starting out pretty aggressive and just, just created the arch, brought back the detail and then polished them up to, I think we went up to about a thousand grit of diamond pads. And I would say each stone, a face of a stone, would take about an hour. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So yeah, in the future, we, we, we would hope to be able to apply. So that, so that area that you're seeing right now is, is a limited area that where Curtis tested this technique and obviously had a lot of success, but it's a lot, it's very labor intensive. So perhaps in the future, we'll be able to kind of get more more funding to, to, to get more of that too. And of course, yeah, the restoration of the park is an ongoing process and there's even more to do with, with, with the Endale component. Um, you know, we, had a, we had a question from the audience about concerns around, uh, I guess, technically uh, the possibility of, of vandalism, some graffiti possibilities. And Serena, you mentioned you might have a thought around that. So we, we did think about this. It's always, uh, you know, something that is on our minds, um, you know, with every restoration. Um, we used a product, an anti-graffiti coating product that is applied to the wood and provides a much easier cleaning. So, you know, while you can't control everything and, and you know, it, it could happen. Um, this will allow it to be removed easily as opposed to kind of setting into the wood. Um, and it's something that would have to be you know, reapplied in the future, but it, it has a certain life and provides protection for a period of time against, yeah, against graffiti. Yeah, that, that's a, some, some, yeah. some attention given to that. It, 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 it's actually called America's best graffiti oh, protector. Yeah. 
the world's best graffiti. Yeah, <laughs> world's best. So they they did they did give us a non toxic um, wash that we tried just about everything on sample wood in our shop from spray paint to to tar to everything and it just seemed to wipe right off it was amazing so it's kind of a sacrificial coating it's almost it's not wax but that's what i would liken it to yeah. and 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 you know I like wax those things don't stick well real well to it and just wipe it off and yeah keep on going i just heard uh, that, that andrew is in the east Eastwood Arch at the moment. Maybe we could uh, jump to him and see what uh, an unrestored arch looks like uh, with the live camera. If you take a minute and do that. Yeah. Um, so I um, I had to move my body a little bit <laughs> to warm up. So I thought this might be a, a neat place um, to go because it a lot of the elements that um, Serena and Curtis were talking about before the restoration. You know, you can see. Uh, in in this uh, in this arch here, so right. Mm -hmm. so if I'm not mistaken, this this arch was built around the same time. Yeah, and if, this is another one of another arch that is you know, similar construction. If yeah, you and there's there's Curtis's uh, mentioned fluorescent. Uh, yep. <laughs> there you go. If you look back at the brick wall that you just yeah. pointed out, you'll see the little pieces of wood missing where they were put into the masonry to attach those sleepers. See those little dark rectangles? Yeah, there might even be some wood still in there. Yeah. Right. You can see yeah. the, the tooth yeah. marks. And that's how they attach the sleepers. So no doubt this this had wood on the inside as well. And that is that white precipitate or is that evidence of white paint? I wonder. The, the upper areas might be efflorescence, but this, this looks like it was painted at some point. Looks like it was painted white. Interesting. Yeah. That's, it's got a little bit of graffiti in here too. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a uh, little commenting. Um, Fantastic. That's beautiful. Uh, thanks. What a, thanks for taking us take taking us uh, there, Andrew. I'm glad you're warming up. Interesting <laughs> to see the um, the similarities. And wouldn't it be lovely one day to raise the funds to uh, to restore this arch as well? I'm certainly I'm sure that's on the on the agenda. Um, and it was the, the Tiger Baron Foundation that provided much of the funding. Probably uh, would be nice to mention that here. Um, and um, well, Curtis, I wanted to give you the opportunity, you know, we've talked a lot about the design of these arches, Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox, of course, a celebrated design team of Prospect Park and of course, Central Park as well. And, um, you know, for one reason or another, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted sort of seems to get top billing in that partnership. And, uh, but they were certainly a design, design pair and Vox being the more um, architecturally uh, experienced in, uh, of those two partners. Um, certainly would have had a lot to do with the resulting shape of the Endel Arch. And Curtis, I know he's a particular, uh, you're a particular fan of his. I'd just love to hear, to give you a chance to, to talk about that curiosity of yours and, um, and maybe the partnership between the two of them and how that might have played out uh, in, the, in the park. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. He, he was uh, trained in England. He did an apprenticeship with a... Uh, a famous architect in England, but also had uh, went to school for landscape architecture. But he was an amazingly uh, diverse architect, and his body of works are astounding. If you look him up, it's it's amazing how many things he did. But he worked before he worked with uh, Olmsted. He was working with Downing. In fact, he was working with Downing when uh, he was uh, killed in that steamboat accident on the East River. And uh, he was in the middle of a couple of projects. He started another partnership after that. Uh, but I'm actually working on the Evergreen Cemetery in Brooklyn, uh, near Bushwick. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're doing redoing some, some of the things there. And he was involved in that as well, as well as Downing. But it just got started when Downing got killed and he kind of took over. So he did several things. and. Uh, 
uh, as you probably know, Olmsted was uh, very much uh, not wanting the Civil War to happen. He he saw it coming years before it happened. Uh, he went he went to school for a little bit in Yale and dropped out, and then went on a his famous tour of the South. And he had went to uh, school with some of the slave owners' sons and thought if he could just go down and talk to them, maybe they would uh, <clears throat> give up this silly notion of owning slaves. But in, in any event, uh, he, through his tours and stuff, he had found out about uh, Central Park Project coming up and he teamed up with Vox and they were a good team. He was not uh, near as serious about the minute details, but he had the overall vision. Whereas Vox wanted to get everything just right. And especially an architectural level, which you can see just by this arch, which is one of many things he did in the park. Um, so uh, another project that I've been working on over the last few years is the National Arts Club, which is in Gramercy Park which is probably the most stunning example of what brownstone living could be during mm. the 1860s, 70s. And uh, it's an amazing, amazing building. And the detail is like none I've ever seen in any other brownstone. But to look at what he did in the park and his architectural stuff and other landscapes uh, that he worked on throughout the country, it just gives you a sense of uh, he was a uh, Renaissance man. He could do just about anything and, and no detail was too small to go, gonna go unnoticed. And he would often walk the construction sites, making sure that what he designed was implemented. So uh, a very interesting person. Yeah. And you can see why they're you know, Renaissance and diverse interests might have, uh, of Vox and Olmsted, how that might have been a good partnership. Well, the other uh, thing was the... that I found interesting is he also uh, studied Gothic architecture in England. He was fascinated mm -hmm. and then he was able to throw a couple of Gothic arches in this thing. <laughs> right. Well, and I'll right. say that Curtis definitely takes after Vox and his um, desire to get everything just right. And we mm -hmm. definitely experience that with, with Endale and, and yeah. yeah, we absolutely all benefit from that uh, from that diligence. Both, and I'm I'm sure Serena, I'm sure you're you're uh, we have you to thank as well for the for the quality of detail that, that's involved there. Well, I can I can start talking just a little bit about the the process, which you know, as as we we've seen over, over the last hour or so, there was a lot of investigative research, but there was also a lot of historical research um, at the beginning. Um, and that also, you know, led into some design, which, which, um, you know, I use certain tools, drawing tools, AutoCAD, you know, certain rendering tools to get an idea of what, what the final product was going to look like, um, as well as, you know, making sure a lot of like all of the trim details and everything um, were sized properly. And it was a lot of but there was a, there was a lot of guess and check um, as we went, but um, you know, creating some images, some drawings, some renderings, definitely aided in the design process and and you know even right. the construction kind of going back and forth. And and a couple, Cindy, there we go. This is some some of the the type of work that that you would be uh, would be involved in this. Detail, detail drawings of every aspect of every every square centimeter would have been replicated and thought about in this case. You know. Yeah, and I was like, you know, we also were as Curtis spoke about getting that that other that one cross fault to be entirely um, original wood, and we wanted to figure out exactly how much existing wood was usable. Uh, and in decent shape so that we could maintain that, that original uh, wood. Mm -hmm. And of course the, the restoration was interrupted by the pandemic, but what was the duration of the restoration? 
Um, it was a couple of years. Yeah, so the, the, this, the restoration included not only some of the, the architectural restoration of the arch, but also um, a lot of landscape work. Um, so that included fixing drainage along the path, as well as the berms on the sides. Right, so so we have, you know, we have also the um, landscape crew at Prospect Park Alliance to thank for that, as well as the volunteers um, who did a lot of the work in removing invasive species, stabilizing the slopes, um, and restoring the landscape on both sides. So, you know, that that I think began in before my time at at the Alliance in in twenty fifteen. Beautiful. Um, uh, we just had, a, I just got a message that, that, uh, that Andrew is now at the Cleft Ridge span. Um, I don't know, Andrew, if you're still there, we, we could take a minute and, uh, and enjoy, enjoy that view. Um, and um, there he is. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, for, I, oh. I just I just thought that this would be a nice place to, to, Absolutely. to wrap up to see that kind of diversity of, of the arches here in the park. But um, yeah. Yeah, this is one of one of my favorites. I mean, I, I love the new restoration of the Endel Arch. It's so striking, but I also love this one, which is which is uh, has these beautiful uh, molded concrete panels in them. So yeah, it's such a different different style of, of you know of inside, and, and one of the first uh, one of the first uh, installations of this kind of molded concrete. Um, Curtis, you probably are well familiar with this technique and technology. Uh, you're muted at the moment, Curtis. Sorry. It's yeah. been actually around since Roman times, but it is a wonderful way to replicate detailed work in a rather rapid way. And, and it, as you can see, no doubt this arch isn't completely watertight anymore because you can see some biological growth, but mm -hmm. it's in beautiful shape. It has lasted through the time almost like it was from the day it was put up it's amazing yeah. and the beton beton coignet as as our as alden mentioned yeah that's what this uh, technique is called so beautiful and a beautiful contrast a uh, very different style um slightly more ornate which is interesting as if this is the entrance entryway into a slightly more ornate as part of the park, uh, with its with the music island being down in this neck of the woods, as well as the boathouse. So we have a more subtle subtle entry into the park and a more ornate experience as we transition into the different use use areas of the park itself. Um, thanks, Andrew. What a what a wonderful uh, what a wonderful surprise addition. Uh, just as as we uh, wrap up here, um, and and we had a. We had a question yeah. I just saw that about the age, and this is this is just a couple of years after um, the Endale Arch, so it's still from Olmsted yeah, across. It's, still, it's early early eighteen seventies. That's right. Yeah. So right around, also right around this arch, um, we've been working on the Concert Grove Pavilion, and that'll be done shortly in in March. So you know, there's a lot of work going on in the park. Absolutely. Yeah, and which is a which is a nice thing. I want to want to ask about that, but um, also before we get to that question about future projects, what what's your experience with uh, how are people enjoying the Endel Arch? Uh, have you been there? Uh, have you been? Uh, what are people? How are, have you how how have you noticed it being uh, sort of appreciated in its post restoration? So yeah, I mean it's been amazing to see all the different ways in, in the way that all the different ways that Endale has been, been used. Yeah, we've seen, we've seen it used as backdrops for photo shoots. Um, I had a friend message me the other day that they're having, they were having a concert, a like impromptu concert. Um, we've seen marriage proposals. Uh, it's been used as little, like smaller classrooms for kids, uh, gather, like just a gathering spot. And of course, you know, it's been used as a, as a rain shelter and, um, and a passageway. So it's been it's been uh, really nice to see the creativity and the excitement around the arch and the well, Yeah, it's been great. That's got to be tremendously satisfying and fulfilling to see that use. And of course, that was the whole point of the park initially, just to provide people with uh, 
you know, in, in the simplest terms, an absolutely beautiful place to come uh, and uh, an environment that works on you in all these subtle and, and significant ways. I, I love how when you just walk through the arch, you can't, in the summertime, you can't see any buildings, but yet you don't feel like you're in a canyon. The, 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 the layers of elevation just sort of block your view, but don't make you feel contained. And of course, it's a massive view, but a, a very actually geographically narrow part of the park. Um, so as we as we move along here towards the end, um, um, yeah, what other let's uh, Curtis and Serena, maybe we can maybe we can close out with this question. But what's 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 next in the park? What are the next projects to get worked on? You mentioned the concert grove. Well, they, I think Andrew's at the pavilion right now, and that's ongoing. Okay. Oh, Andrew's there. Yeah, thanks for catching that, Curtis. Um, Andrew, if you're still there, let's take a look. So that will be opening really soon in March. Um, and again, you know, it'll be another space that can be used um, as, you know, people are now gathering more and more outside safely. Um, it's really extraordinarily important to have spaces that are you know, covered spaces where people can gather in, in the rain or snow and, 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 you know, still be outdoors. Um, so yeah, that'll be opening soon. That's really uh, exciting. That's been going on for a little while. And um, also recently, we, uh, the Prospect Park Alliance completed and opened the new entrance on um, Flatbush. So that was a big project that's also really exciting now to be enjoyed by the community. So important to open up that that edge of the park, uh, a really uh, important achievement for the Alliance. Um, and, and Curtis, you mentioned that you were working on the on the carousel. What's what's um, what, what needs to be done to the carousel right now? What what's the hope there? there there's a little bit of brick repair and, and roof repair and some paving around the outside that needs done. But uh, before COVID, we just had finished up uh, another section of the inside, which was really what drove the project. Um, the exterior structure is brick with big arches that have doors that open so people can come from all eight sides and join uh, getting on uh, horses. But uh, the interior of the structure is a huge laminated beam, timber frame structure. And it holds up, uh, if you've been to the carousel, you know that there's a cupola on top that brings in light and lights up the inside. It's a, a beautiful structure. But the brick had started to crack in an unusual way. On two sides, the brick structure had slid about an inch and a half in the same areas right at the top of the arches. And after some investigation and so forth, uh, originally some of the engineers felt that it was pack rust were uh, steel rust and it pushes bricks up. We've all seen that probably, but there, there was no vertical movement. It was just horizontal. So uh, we were able to take off uh, some trim around the wood posts that are the columns holding up the structure. And uh, it uh, appeared that they were encapsulated in concrete and the building hadn't held water. It wasn't watertight. So it created a bathtub of about a foot on these big, massive 12 inch by 24 inch beams that were made out of wood. So when I took a drill bit <clears throat> and just pushed on it, I was able to push all the way through the beam. So they were completely rotten, turned to uh, like mush and then it was mostly on one side. So then they started to compress and come down from gravity and it just pulled the building over just a little bit. So right. we went back in and cut all eight posts off a foot higher than where they had been and shored the entire building up, held it up and then re-poured another piece of concrete. But this time we didn't encapsulate the wood. We let it sit out or put it on stainless steel pads and. And it was it was not glamorous, but was very fun and challenging to do. Yeah, wonderful. Sounds like an important piece of restoration. And this is your this is your rendering, Serena. Looks oh, yeah. looks like you got it pretty much right. 
Yeah, this was just, you know, one, one, one other way, one other tool we use to kind of create the vision. Um, yeah. To see what we... Beautiful. So, so, so yeah, I mean, I think it is really important to, to note that, um, like Curtis said, whether it seems like glamorous work or, or structural work, it's super important to be able to maintain the structures of the park and, uh, you know, for, you know, to, to, for the purposes of maintaining history, but as well as uh, recognizing the importance that the park has today for, for the community. Yeah, it's so critical. Thank you so much for the work that you do with the Alliance um, and thank uh, and, and keeping it all together and, and safe and beautiful for us to, to enjoy. And thank you, Curtis, for your participation in this project of Barnhart Restoration and also for your work in, in, in at, the, at the park and also elsewhere in Brooklyn. I'm sure we may have appreciated some of your work and not quite known it. So thank you for your efforts there. Uh, it's been thank a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It yeah. Nice. What was that, Curtis? I said thank you and for inviting me. It was very oh, nice. Oh, absolutely. Our our, our blessing and our pleasure to, to have you here. Um, and thank you all for joining in today and, and chiming in with your comments. My apologies if I didn't get to comment on all of your comments. There's some really interesting chat going on there. Um, but please join us again for uh, future Turnstile programs and make your way to Prospect Park and see the archway in person and maybe even join us on that in-person tour of Prospect Park on February 14th. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.